Uh, I'm very happy to present to you uh, the topic Voices of Europe and the Voices with their Owners. Uh, uh, Francesca Melandri from Rome, uh, Sandra Ireland from Dundee, not from Ireland, from Scotland, yes, and Gabi Martinez from Barcelona. I'm very happy because I was everywhere, including Dundee, so actually. I probably can imagine where they live. I don't. I didn't ask your address, but anyway, uh, voices of Europe. I mean, the topic is very general, and we will now probably uh, destructure it to something much smaller and much more digestible. And uh, let us first hear the voice of Francesca Melandri, and it will be not only voice of an author, but also or a voice of Italy, but even sometimes not only of Italy, because in her book which I love, uh, Eva Sleeps, actually it tells us the story of Italy which used to be Austria, South Tyrol, and it actually it talks about migration, uh, integration, assimilation, lots of other problems, but it is all on the background of wonderful family saga. Please. Yeah, well, uh, nobody introduced you, so Andrei Kurkov, uh, oh, uh, eminent Ukrainian writer. Thank you. Can you hear me? Does this work? Yes? So thank you, Andre, for uh, showing, as you always do, your enthusiasm for my novel. I'm so moved every time you, you say it because it feels so passionate and uh, thank you. So yes, uh, Eva Sleeps, which is the book I, I have here also at the bookshop, um, it's actually my first novel. I wrote two more after that. Uh, but it's a very fitting novel, I think, for a panel called European Voices. Um, as Andre was telling you, it, it's a family saga of three generations, although the middle generation is a woman called Gerda and she's the real protagonist. Um, the, the background, the historical background is uh, this region, this very small region in the Alps. Maybe someone between you can have an idea of where the Dolomites are, the, the famous, you know, the beautiful pinky rocks. Uh, where everybody goes skiing and trekking, and that's South Tyrol. And Tyrol is, as you can hear, uh, a German uh, toponym. It used to be Austria, and then at the end of First World War, as a punishment to Austria and as a prize to Italy, it was taken away from Austria. North Tyrol was left to Austria, but South Tyrol was given to Italy. So Italy was given this piece of mountainous land where people are absolutely Germanic. They are absolutely Austrian. They speak German, uh, a, a special kind of German dialect. Um, uh, they have really nothing to do with Italians. They, they eat German food, German-style food. Uh, so it was a kind of really a violent uh, detachment, which was very resented by the people. And uh, then, of course, things got even worse with Italian fascism. For 20 years, we had fascism in Italy. And the idea of Mussolini, the fascist duce, was to, quote unquote, Italianize South Tyrol, like imperialistic powers do on minorities. This is a very you know, mm, universal story. In fact, with this book, I have been, travel I have been traveling really all over the world. Uh, and it's interesting, also in the Ukraine, I was invited by Andrea at the Kiev Arsenal Festival. Um, in so many countries, India absolutely included, there are stories which reflect this kind of story, that is the story of a majority state with minority, or minorities, depends how big the state is, uh, ethnical or religious, um, uh, linguistic, uh, minorities, which are at odds with the uh, predominant uh, culture, uh, language, or religion. So you can imagine, I've been with this book, sort of just to name a few, uh, yeah, to the Ukraine, where they have the problem of Crimea and the you know, Russian, uh, inf the Russian uh, empire, uh, or to Ireland, where of course the topic was Northern Ireland, Ulster. I've been to Canada, and uh, there with the, the talking was about both Quebec and also another kind of minority within the majority, the Native Americans. So, and, and in India, I don't have to tell you how, <laughs> how frequent this topic is. So it's, it's, it's an interesting book to, to travel with, 
because in a way it's a very European story. Uh, the story of Europe is a bloody history, and ha has been a very bloody history until 70 years ago, because of all these moving borders and crisscrossed ethnicities, culture wars, religious wars, um, and this kind of situation is just one, as I said, of the many. Uh, so it's a very European uh, story. Europe was shaped of these histories and the European Union is in fact the idea that came up to transcend this kind of conflict and this kind of perpetual mm, striving and, and warring with each, with each other's neighbor al al always. So. Um, the, the history of South Tyrol is actually very interesting and specific because, in a way, it's a success story. Now I'm talking about the politics of the book. Of course, now I'm not talking about the more novelistic, the family, the story, the characters. I'm talking about the politics behind the book. The history of South Tyrol is a success story, which is also one of the reasons why I was really moved to, 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 to write this book. Because it, beca it began, as I said, as one of the many typical bloody little European histories of people fighting with their neighbor, Italians against Germans and putting, and then terrorism became, uh, came and then counter-terrorism with a very bloody rep um, repression, all things which we are all familiar with in all our countries. Um, the particular thing about the, the, history, the history of South Tyrol and not only, of, which is the background of my book, through the story of this family, is that there was a political resolution to all this. And now, South Tyrol has been since the 70s, when this final political resolution was mm, implemented. Since then, so in more than 40 years now, uh, has been a very peaceful place. It's become a very prosperous place. Uh, they have what has been called the white uh, gold, that is snow. It's, uh, it's a skiing resort, uh, and then also tourism. So tourism has brought a lot of money, and now it's one of the richest regions of the whole of Europe. So basically one of the richest places in the world. Uh, and it used to be a very, very poor, mountainous peasant agri agricultural, you know. Agriculture, mm, peasants are never the richest people in the world, and mountain peasants are even poorer. So it used to be really one of the poorest places in Europe and now it's one of the most prosperous and this is because there was a, politi a political um, solution. Uh, some time ago, two or three years ago, the New York Times, uh, there was an article about South Tyrol uh, and it mentioned the so-called South Tyrolian model, which is a model of South Tyrolians didn't obtain independence they are still part of Italy, but they have a very strong autonomy, somewhat like Catalonia, maybe you will maybe talk about that if, if I get it right, if it's uh, very, very strong independence, um, I mean, sorry, autonomy, so also budget-wise and cultural-wise, but they are part of Italy. And, um, and the New York Times, and this is the last thing I say before passing on, uh, mentioned the so-called South Tyrolean model as a possible resolution model. Of course, no situation is exactly like any other, so as a model, not as a just the, the exact way of doing things, but as a model. For example, for the solution of many of these so frequent minority problems, for instance, specifically, this article was about the Kurds in uh, Syria and Iraq, the, 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 the Kurdish population, which is, you know, this population in the, in the three states of Iran and Iraq and, and Syria. And uh, it mentioned the South Tyrolean model as a possible um, guideline for the solution of this kind of, mm. of problems. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go from South Tyrol mountains to Scottish hills or highs. Hi, Sandra, uh, you are right in uh, uh, psychological uh, black thrillers. Yes. Is there a space in these thrillers for politics, maybe for Scottish dream of independence. I'm sure there are there is a lot of whiskey there. That's probably uh, I'm not mistaken. No, I don't drink whiskey. But no, no, but your characters. <laughs> I mean, uh, there are things I don't drink, but I let my yeah. characters drink what I don't drink. That's right. Yeah. Um, well, 
Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about my work, and it was really interesting to meet the rest of the panel, um, <clears throat> and just to talk about what we have in Maybe common. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting to talk about the things that we have in common, and the fact that we're here shows you how people can be brought together through books, which I think is wonderful. And at a time when Scotland is very um, in upheaval at the moment, and I'm not going to even mention the Brexit word, um, but it's really refreshing to find out about the ways we connect and how we want to, s we should stay together because stories transcend borders and that's really important to remember. So in my work, um, I write psychological thrillers. They're based in Scotland, but they're very localized to the place around where I live. I live um, north of Edinburgh, which is the capital, and south of the beautiful dramatic landscape of the Highlands. So I'm kind of in the middle. Um, I'm sandwiched between the beautiful hills and glens of the county of Angus and the North Sea, which is not as uh, tranquil and gorgeous as the Indian Ocean, but it's a bit of a beast and it has mountainous waves and it's very atmospheric. And I think it's a really good place for a writer to be inspired. So I definitely um, find my inspiration from that sort of dramatic landscape. And also from um, its sense of place uh, and the buildings uh, which are left, um, a reminder of, of um, a different times. Uh, it's a very, very uh, country, very rich in history. So my first novel is called Beneath the Skin. That was actually set in Edinburgh. Uh, and that's um, quite an urban landscape. Most of the action takes place in a dark basement, which in itself is uh, quite eerie. Um, I love this idea of things being hidden and secrets about to unfold. But the second novel, Bone Deep, which unfortunately I've just given away the copy that I had, so I can't show you the cover, but it's just been uh, published in India in English, which I'm delighted to say, and is now in the bookshop. So it was uh, wonderful to be here and actually to see my book on the shelf in the bookshop. Um, Bone Deep is a story of two sisters, and my inspiration from, for that came from a very old border ballad. In Scotland, um, obviously, we have a very rich storytelling culture, which you do have here as well. Um, the border ballads were collected. They, they tell wonderful stories of Scotland, of the landscape, and um, how the people connect with the landscape. The story of the two sisters um, is about an older sister and a younger sister who quarrel over a man and the older sister pushes the younger sister into the mill pond. Now, there is a mill in this book, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, the, the girl floats downstream and is caught up in the mill wheel. Uh, we have lots of mills in Scotland, or we used to have long ago. Um, she's rescued by the miller, but she's already deceased. And he um, presents her to the family in the form of a harp which sings of the older girl's guilt. And when I read this story, I was absolutely fascinated. But I'm not a historical novelist, so I thought I want to make something new. And I think that's what we do as writers. We make new out of old. Um, so Bone Deep has this strand of this old tale running through it. But it's a bit about two very modern sisters who have their own problems. So. Um, this is the, the, the premise of Bone Deep. It has this, this strand running through it. And what interests me very much, the more I wrote the book, the more I researched the story, I found that the same, almost identical story appears in over 200 countries, 200 cultures. Um, I found that there was an Indian version um, from West Bengal, which reflects um, the, the, the community there that, um, the, the marriage customs and rights there are reflected in the story. So wherever you go, this story pops up. I don't know if any of you have come across this in your countries, um, but the, the details are slightly changed. And um, I think the power of these old stories to connect uh, is very refreshing, and it, it brings us into a new arena. I mean, Bone Deep is actually going to be published in Germany, and they, of course, have this uh, wonderful fairy tale um, tradition, the Grimm brothers and so on. And they were very excited by the strand of folklore. And it's also going to be published in America. Um, the Americans have um, 
uh, well, they have this huge connection um, with Scotland, of course, because we had all the emigrants. Um, but the, they love the old castles and the mountains and the lochs. And um, so I think that's a, a way that we can connect with each other through our storytelling traditions. Well, I, it's, it's a very good idea to be connected through stories, not through the political uh, developments. Avoided <laughs> you avoided it purposely, <laughs> yes. I'm sure Gabi Martinez will not avoid it because he writes fiction and non-fiction and I think it's probably impossible not to be politicized when you live in uh, Barcelona, in, in Catalonia. Yes, but before I was not so much politicized, but after some some um, things that has happened there, I am more politician. In fact, to explain my my country, some mood is uh, very useful to know my own experience because when I want to uh, present like author, I I decide the first uh, decision important is how I present myself to the public because my name is Gabriel, but. For my family, I am Gabby. All the people uh, tell me Gabby. So for me, it was very difficult to enter into a system where all the people were signing with the name that maybe sometimes they were recognized by their family, but sometimes not. They, sometimes people that were coming from other tradition, for, from uh, that they were. Uh, I, for example, in English we can find the example, and for me it was very important to read uh, um, Walt Whitman, for example, uh, to read that he has signed it like Walt because he wanted to communicate to the people like uh, the, the family and his friends were talking with him, were calling him. He was Walter, but in the, in the books he is Walt. For me, this example, for example, it was important to decide that I wanted to be Gabby, like mm, my family, my friends uh, called me. After this, that this is finally maybe a, a politician decision, maybe it, it has something of this. Um, I have written novels also, and I have I've made a journalism. And in a moment, I um, discovered that the country that the the um, medias were explaining to me it wasn't the country that I knew so I was to the to the streets to write in a book that is uh, the title more or less the translation it will be an Spani an unexpected Spain that is the country that you are looking uh, is so modern with people uh, using the, the mobiles, watching 500 of channels of television. After, when you look at the people, that is also very good look, at, very well dressed, very well dressed, uh, but they, their thoughts are more or less similar to the people who were uh, in the war. Maybe more, uh, more polite, I am, maybe I am, it's in a, a little exagger exaggeration, but finally I have discovered that it's not so big, this exaggeration, because now we are in a point where all the people that um, 20 years ago went into the country, we had money, uh, or we thought that we had money, now we are conscient that we have not so much money and the uh, fights into the, into the country uh, had uh, begun in another mood, in another more uh, hard mood, not violent, and I think this is a big difference that we are not in here in Catalonia. The uh, reivindications are not violent, but some people who were uh, that is thinking in another mood, they have used the violence and they had, uh, they have uh, used also the judges to make things that are out of law. The, the, in, now we are in a country where the judges are acting out of law. And I is very, mm, finally, you have to be politician when you speak because you are invited by the, the politics. So I have written, for example, when I began to write also, 
I have two books that have never been published because in some moment someone decided that this book it wasn't uh, correct. Now I'm, we are now uh, talking about uh, exactly um, one of them, yes, was published, two that wasn't published and w another that uh, the politicians uh, asked for he was re released, he was out of the of the bookshops because they didn't like what I was talking about. I was talking, but in the Canary Islands, uh, there are volcans. Volcans? Yes. Volca volcano. Volcanoes. And if you uh, build, uh, if you make buildings so uh, m uh, close to the sea, uh, um, it's m it may Maybe it's dangerous because, and you know very well that it's possible that if the volcano erupts, so can a tsunami, and this um, first line of buildings can be uh, destroyed. destroyed. So I speak about a lot of things uh, of uh, Canary Islands, but this uh, point was not very nice for some. Um, uh, for one way, politicians, uh, for the other, for empresarios, for um, managers. M for the managers. So, I received um, the petitions of, uh, for my book was out of bookshops. After this, I have written other two books that have never been published when I had the contract to be published. But they say, at the beginnings, they say, okay, go and write about this, this subject. But they know that maybe if you want to respect yourself as writer and as journalist in this case, maybe you are going to write like you want to write. And when they find your book, they don't want to publish the book. It's not a very usual situation, but it is, now it's a situation that you can find uh, still in, in Spain. So when you um, you find yourself in front and a situation like the uh, fight between two governments now, like the Catalan government and Spanish government, I I am not independentist, but I can understand people who defend the independence. And if the other side of the of of, of the um, the parts say some things that I can share like person I'll be with the, the, the people who I think are defending the human rights finally finally it, it's difficult to talk about this thing without talk about politics but uh, it shows that you are in the middle of the conflict and actually we are used to the idea that there is no censorship in Europe uh, I mean, your example shows that there is a censorship and probably the censorship can uh, be quickly reinstated in any corner of Europe if there yeah. is a problem or there is a political conflict, etc. Yeah. Uh, very interesting uh, phrase uh, we've heard actually now that the book explains. We are used to the idea that, that the book tells the story. Uh, your book and your books, uh, sorry, do, do they explain Scotland or they tell the stories that take place in Scotland? Well, that's a really interesting uh, thing. We, we, we chatted about that earlier. Um, what, what do people that are not from Scotland make of the story of the Scotland that we portray? And I can only speak personally, um, but I think uh, my novels are very, um, very grounded. They're about ordinary people. I think they're universal. And I think they would resonate with anybody, to be honest, because everybody has the same problems. They love, they lose people, um, they um, make unwise choices, they get into trouble. And I think that's, that's a universal thing. So I don't think, I think stories have the ability to um, resonate with anybody. It doesn't matter where they're from. Um, I think I portray Scotland in quite a sympathetic way because I love, I love the country, I love the landscape. And I think that maybe maybe I show a flip side. Maybe I show the dark side of it. But it's only coming from my imagination. So, you know, you can always come to Scotland for yourselves and find out. 
sorry for one more question. Do your characters discuss politics? No. <laughs> <laughs> so they have no idea what is happening actually like no, in London. No, they're far too busy. Far um, too busy killing each other? Yes, yeah, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's a nice explanation, yes. Uh, I'm sure uh, Francesca's uh, books explain actually not uh, more than Italy, but I mean how the books are perceived in Italy because I mean you cannot explain Italy to Italians, although I think in your case you can. Well, uh, an interesting thing when this book came out was that uh, this is a very, as I said, small story of a very small region, uh, marginalized because it's really at the margin of the country. It's literally, uh, uh, concretely at the margins of the country. And uh, the interesting reaction of so many Italian readers was we had no idea of this, of this story, which also is, is a story in itself, which is also one of the reasons why I wrote it, because um, it's the relationship between the mainstream narrative and the minority narratives, which is also one of the topics of the book. Who tells which story? Uh, just to give you an idea of how unknown this story is in Italians, a lot of Italians, uh, middle class Italians, all know South Tyrol, because they all know, all go there to ski or to walk in, in the summer. It's, it's a really an amazingly beautiful place. Uh, so they know South Tyrol. They have been there. Um, by the way, some Bollywood movies have also been shot in, in South Tyrol because they have a, a, a very rich film commission. As I said, it's now a prosperous region. So they have money. They have a film commission which entices a lot of filmmakers from all over the world. And the landscape is so beautiful. So there have been quite a few Indian cin cin uh, cinema makers, filmmakers coming to, to the green pastures of, of South Tyrol. Um, so people go there and know about its physical beauty, its geographical beauty, but they have no idea about the history. And since, as I said, it's a region where people, most of the, um, the majority speaks German, um, so when they speak Italian, they speak with a very strong German accent. And that's how they speak to Italian tourists, with a strong German accent. And the typical Italian um, mainstream, oblivious reaction is, why are they speaking with this German accent? They're doing it on purpose because they, do, they hate us Italians. So it's, and they're completely uninterested in un understanding why these people are actually speaking with a German accent. By the way, they are speaking Italian, so they, they are trying to anyway communicate in the language of the, of the foreigner coming, so they are making the effort. Also because the tourist is bringing money, of course, but it, they are doing it. But okay, they, they have their accent, so what's wrong with that? But even that is perceived as a, th this is wrong. We are in Italy, people should speak Italian. This is the typical sentence that you can hear from, I call them oblivious Italians when they come to South Tyrol, as if the history of, of South Tyrol was totally unknown. And th in fact, there's a sentence at the end of the book which says something about, uh, no, in fact, it's uh, in, the, in, the, in the thanks at the end of the book. Uh, um, I know this region because I went there as a small child with my family as a tourist. Uh, that's, that, that's how my relationship... Then I married a man from South Tyrol and that helps to get into the culture, of course. But um, the, the first uh, uh, connection was as a tourist and I really have to thank my mother because uh, she always was very, very curious about okay, why are these people German speakers? And she was interested and she read books. So this passed on to, as a natural thing to us. And so the sentence in the, in the thanks at the end of the book is a region about which Italians know, know and love the geography, but have absolutely no idea about the history. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm, no, uh, I'm going just the present. I mean, I have. Uh, I will. I will say a few words. But I. I wanted to know. I mean, you published only one book. You were able to publish one book, yes, and two books were turned down by the publishers. Yes, I have published thirteen books. But thirteen. Thirteen books. Okay. But, but, but uh, it, uh, I. It, it, I could be. I could have uh, 13, fifteen books. Yeah, but no. I, there are two that have not been. But published. I mean, it, I have a feeling that actually you are writing uh, not for international audience. You are much more interested to get to Spanish audience, to Spanish readers, it Catalan depends. readers. It depends on the book, but really, 
these two, two books were especially for Spanish audience, yes. And the, the publishers, one was about a case that the TV made very famous, uh, a boy in a relationship with a very famous person, but I received the uh, conditions of the television that I must explain one kind of history. And I discovered that the history was not so marvelous that the, mm -hmm. the TV was explaining. And the other was about uh, an independent uh, um, politician. Yeah. And I don't know why, but uh, after to write and after to um, be pilot, but the middle um, uh, price of the yeah. of the ad 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 advancement, uh, I I had um, gained this um, this money, but I didn't. I never received it, the second part of, of the money because finally they decided that they didn't want to know the uh, to publish this story about a politician. But did, did it uh, help uh, your reputation as an honest writer? I mean, the fact that your two books were taken and then uh, put down, yeah. turned down. Yeah, maybe I, I am fighting for my idea of the world and, yeah. and my idea of the journalist uh, of the uh, like writer. I. I decided I wanted to be writer, but when I decide to be writer, finally, is when after working in with magazine and journals for more or less maybe five years, being young, and I decide I don't want to stay into this shit. I want yeah. to explain the world like the the, the teachers of journalism tell me that it was the the journalism. Yeah. Uh, have you ever tried journalism yourself? <laughs> I have. Actually, um, I, w I wouldn't say I was a journalist. That's gone too far. I was a correspondent for a, a very local newspaper. And I did it for quite a while, and I actually really enjoyed it. But fiction is much more fun than fact, because you can make it up. Although that's, um, that's a controversial point. <laughs> well, I mean, there is a lot of journalism made up yeah, now. So it's... Uh, Sometimes uh, there is almost no difference between fiction and That's journalism. True. But I, I was really good at making things up, but not not for the paper. But I thought uh, this is I, I wanted to be more creative. Uh, I, I don't know how, how, how you feel about journalism, but it does kind of stunt your creativity a little bit, and uh, you don't have the same freedom. So I wanted to um, just go in a different direction. I think real journalism makes you fit and angry. No? Yes, something like that. Maybe <laughs> not on my scale. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say maybe just a few words about uh, my writings. I, I think I do explain uh, Ukraine and post-Soviet space in my books, although I took a risk uh, with my one but last book, which is called in French Vilnius Paris, Paris La London. It's published in German, Lithuanian and uh, uh, French so far, and it's a novel about Europe with no Ukrainians and no Ukraine present. It is actually a story of m internal migration in uh, Schengen zone in, in European space, and it is a story of three young couples from Lithuania, uh, which is uh, a, a small country now, uh, forgotten by main European countries, but used to be the biggest European state in 14th, 15th century, and they are now the this country, with, which had 20 years ago a population of 3.5 million, now has 2.7. The others, mostly young people, left. And they, they left, a lot of them, to England, to Scotland, to Norway, etc. And they are treated there just like, uh, not refugees, but I mean, Eastern Europeans uh, trying to uh, come and to earn money because Europe forgot its history and they forgot that actually they were the basis for, the, for Europe <laughs> of today. Yeah, but in my other books I am trying to explain the situation in Ukraine. In latest book, which is coming out this year in English, Grey Bees, uh, it's the uh, book, a novel about uh, life in the grey zone of Donbass, uh, in the, uh, this no man's land uh, between the positions of Ukrainian army and positions of uh, pro-Russian separatists and Russians, professional, professionals and volunteers, and about life of uh, Crimean Tatars in a next Crimea. It's interesting that Ukrainian writers are avoiding writing novels about Crimea because they think that Russia took it for good and it will never become again Ukrainian. But even if it never become Ukrainian, it cannot 
be sort of thrown out from the Ukrainian history and as a topic from the Ukrainian novels. Yes. Maybe uh, you have questions to our panelists, and uh, that would be great uh, if. Do we have a microphone? Yeah, we can we can share a microphone. This is a very good microphone. We don't need a microphone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Andrew, you said very few things about you, but the Ukraine and Russia. I know the things are not very good. I'm not going to the politics or anything. But does language has any any impact on this condition? Well, I, I mean, mean uh, the forceful forceful implication of uh, Russian language has any. Yeah, to do with uh, this. We, we, we all here speak wonderful English, uh, including you, uh, because of the history, because of uh, British Empire. Uh, all, everybody in Ukraine understands or understands and speaks Ukrainian because of the Soviet Empire and bef because of the Russian Empire before. Uh, so, I mean, the language issue is uh, very painful for the Ukrainians. The, today is the only official language in Ukraine is uh, Ukrainian, of course, but there are 26 minority languages which have officially the same rights, but because of the war with Russia and annexation of Crimea, the Russian language, which is spoken by probably now by 40% of population, is considered by uh, nationalists as the language of the enemy. So I'm myself also writing novels in language of the language of the enemy, which is my mother tongue, but I also write non-fiction and children's books in, in Ukrainian. And I speak Ukrainian fluently with no accent. So linguistic issue is important, but uh, much more important is psychological issue. The difference of mentality, of uh, Russian mentality and Ukrainian. I'm talking not about ethnic groups, because I mean, Russia uh, it has 150 nationalities and they all speak Russian. And sometimes they forget their mother tongues, but they have the same sort of communal uh, mental portrait. Uh, Russians are, uh, I would say, the... They, they are collective nation. They have collective uh, mentality, psychology. They, they are used to do everything together uh, in a crowd, trying not to show uh, their faces. When they, I mean, this is a, uh, they, they lived uh, uh, always in real or not very real monarchy, but I mean, they are used to have one person who stays in power until he dies. Uh, this was the Tsar's times. Then it was uh, the communist times when the general secretaries were re elected, re-elected, re-elected, buried. And, that, and it happened to everyone except Khrushchev, who was Ukrainian. And I think, uh, actually, he was thrown out of the power because he had not this proper collective mentality. As a Ukrainian, he had individualist mentality. The historical matrix of Ukraine is anarchy. So Ukraine was an incredible, unique state in 15th century with no fixed borders with no currency of its own, but with election of the head of the army, with Cossack system, with military courts, uh, and uh, with lots of other things, with, with uh, the embassies, with diplomatic service, which was sent regularly to Moscow or to Istanbul. So you have uh, the border between collective mentality and individualist mentality, and this border was, 20 years ago, was cut in Ukraine into two parts. But because of people and young people turn in more pro-European, more, uh, I mean, they, they were European, but I mean, sort of, they, they were trying to escape, uh, to run away from this collective irresponsibility and collective mentality. They were entrepreneurs, the young people. So the borders, the border between collective mentality and non-collective was moving slowly to the east, towards Russia. And if we didn't have this conflict, in 10, 15 years, finally this border would coincide with actual border between Russia and Ukraine. And I think uh, Russians were, of course, uh, the Russian government was afraid that this, this can happen and they will lose control over a huge country of size of uh, France with uh, incredible agricultural uh, industries and lots of other things. So, I mean, this, this problem uh, started and there is no end uh, so far. I mean, the front line is 450 kilometers long and we have daily uh, exchanges of artillery and fights and every day there are people killed and wounded. And now, I think in the next two or three years, Russia will swallow Belarus. I mean, the Belarus will disappear as an independent state, uh, which will mean that actually Russia will surround. Russia already has uh, arms and military bases, new military bases on the border, on the Belarusian side of the Ukrainian-Belarusian border. Uh, 
uh, when they throw out Lukashenko and take over completely uh, Belarus, Ukraine will be practically surrounded by Russia and the annexation of Azov Sea, which happened recently, as you know, when, after the attack of uh, Russian, I don't know how many, 25 or, or more military uh, ships on three military boats uh, with Ukrainian seamen. I mean, it, it shows that actually uh, the expansion is going on. So, I mean, uh, Putin is not going to give up and I don't know... Uh, he will be in power until he dies because he is a monarch. You don't need elections uh, in Russia. And actually, some members of the parliament, they say that we shouldn't have presidential elections uh, because we have a president and we shouldn't waste money. So uh, I cannot predict uh, uh, Ukrainian future. I hope for the best. And I, I, uh, I remember, I mean, bad times in 1992-93 when... Uh, people were running away from Russia, from Ukraine to the West because I mean, life was very criminal. People were very poor. And somebody asked me whether I am still an optimist or I am normal pessimist like everybody else. And I remember I answered, no, no, I'm an optimist still, but I'm a black optimist. Uh, so my friend asked, what does it mean to be black optimist? I said, well, that's when you are sure that everything will, fi will end very well, but you are not sure that you will survive to this moment. Uh, I, I am a great optimist now, and I hope that actually that Europe, as a major power in also in this uh, Russian-Ukrainian relationship, will carry on with the sanctions and with the support for Ukraine. And I hope that Ukrainian politicians will learn slowly how not to be corrupt. This is to the uh, Spanish writer. So, are your books got uh, uh, banned after the Catalonian independence, or? before. Uh, before, yes. Before and other when the conflict was coming on. But for this, um, when I began uh, to talk how I decided and uh, to write like with the, dim dim with the short name, with like Gabby, that it was a politician movement because the, the, the question, the problem of the powers that are directing the country, they were there. And, and you could look at, at this. I wrote an unexpected Spain because all this uh, country was different, was in the spirit, was the same of years before. So, um, when I write the, the first book that is uh, censor, that they want to to be censored, was when the the, the speculata speculators the uh, um, the buildings are being constru constructed and the corruption is going on. So this is the first book that has problems, and we have not any conflict with with uh, Catalonia. After I wrote another, with the conflict is in this case with a television, and the conflict is not there with Catalonia. And after I write about a politician, and there, yes, we have the, at this moment we have the, the conflict, but finally, the Catalonia conflict is only the moment you can see public for the, all the world can see that in Spain we have a problem that is that politicians and the managers are uh, people that for long years they have been uh, corrupted. So, but, but when you speak about this to other people, the people is, is normal, the news um, only accept one uh, titular one interpretation, and is independence uh, or not, are violence or not. But to arrive there is a long way of corruption and judges that are working for the, for the government. Um, my question is directed to Mr. Kirchhoff. You mentioned out Ukraine. And I mean, I have not read any of your books, but uh, my query is you have uh, very nicely uh, explain the conflict between Russia, uh, Ukraine, and uh, even Europe. Um, and also you mentioned about the collective uh, mentality and the individualistic. 
Now my question is, my doubt is, um, is it not the case, because Ukraine was a part of the so former Soviet Union earlier, so is not Ukraine culture and even the linguistic reality uh, very much influenced by, let's say, the great Russian literature and uh, the great Russian tradition? This is one question. And secondly, um, so in that sense, will it not be the collective identity relating to Russia and socialism more in some sense for you all familiar than now trying to accumulate another collective identity with uh, Europe and I would say even more than Europe with the imperialism of America and the NATO military uh, terror there how would you justify or does this or do these conflict situations not only with Russia and um, the independent Ukraine state but also the tension between the NATO army, the American power seeking and the military strategies, do they reflect? Uh, I, I, I want to connect politics yeah. and writing. Yeah, I can see. I mean, we could have a panel on this topic, uh, or topic of your question. Uh, the history of Ukraine is quite complex. Even the Soviet period of history, you know that uh, Western Ukraine, which is probably a third of the country, became part of the Soviet Ukraine thanks to the Ribbentrop and Molotov agreement. Agreement between Stalin and Hitler when they were deciding how to divide Europe. So they, they took away part of Ukraine which was in Poland and part of Ukraine that was in Romania, in Romanian kingdom at that time. So these people were always under influence of more European values and more, uh, European culture, etc. Uh, the w Eastern Ukraine, the population was uh, changed uh, drastically in 1930s when Eastern Ukraine Donbass was developed as industrial region. They didn't have enough population, so Soviet Union brought there hundreds of thousands of uh, resettlers from Central Russia, not only from Central Russia, even from Korea uh, and from Western Ukraine. So there was uh, a huge mixture of nationalities there, and these regions were from 91 until 2013 under control not of Ukrainian government and not of Russian Federation, but under the control of local industrial mafia, which wanted actually to, uh, to t take under control the coal production, coal sales, and lots of other things. And so, I mean, this region was only one political party territory. If you were trying to establish the office of another party, it would be burned down and you could be killed. So, I mean, it was a very specific place which had nothing to do with culture, including Russian culture. Of course, all the generation and my generation knows very well uh, Russian classical literature and Russian music, and nobody says that actually it should be thrown out. But as the reaction to uh, Russification, to, to the push, pushing Russian language more to the West, where it was never spoken, the, the, the ethnic Ukrainians, who are worried and were worried about the future of their ethnic group, main, main actually group, and their culture, they are pushing back uh, now the borders of uh, uh, Russian language. But, uh, I mean, what happens uh, is a very paradoxical situation because once the war in Donbass started, lots of refugees, altogether one, uh, almost two million out of seven million of inhabitants, uh, many of them went to Russia, and uh, 1.5 million refugees, who are mostly Russian speakers, went to Western Ukraine. And now you can hear their Russian language spoken on the street, where almost nobody spoke Russian. So, I mean, there are lots of issues, but we have to choose where we want to belong, because uh, Ukraine, as some other countries in the region, they not, not powerful, not rich enough, and also very corrupt, so it cannot stand on its own. It cannot become neutral Switzerland, because for that you have actually to take money in your banks from both sides. So uh, nobody wants to go back to 
uh, Russian or Soviet system, uh, and you know, in Russia now you can be imprisoned for liking the post on a Facebook or sharing a post. There are 3,000 uh, 3, cases or court cases against people who just liked or shared or wrote the posts, and 600 people were sent to prison. So, I mean, the, the country has official censorship. The country actually now is introducing a criminal, uh, an article in the criminal code for, that you will be, can be imprisoned for criticizing the government or just civil servants. Uh, does Ukraine want to go or to become part of this entity? Of course not. And uh, there is more respect to private property in Ukraine traditionally than it was in Russia where in 1917 all the private property was taken away from rich people or from people who built it and uh, nationalized and uh, became sort of uh, uh, state property. So, I mean, we, we are talking about two different ways. So, uh, of course, there is no Warsaw Pact now. There is no uh, balanced uh, military union uh, which could counteract NATO. But, I mean, Russia is powerful enough on its own. And of course, I mean, you, you can see what is happening. Once Russia decides to be aggressive, North Korea becomes to be ag becomes aggressive, and immediately, uh, actually, in 2015 or 14, after the uh, more fighting in Donbas, <coughs> leader of North Korea promises publicly to destroy America. So I mean, there are uh, allies, military allies. Uh, 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 that Russia has, including Venezuela, which is in troubles, but somehow secret planes are flying now from Moscow to Caracas. And according to one version, they are filled with gold to, to sort of save the economy, or according to the other version, uh, they are filled with mercenaries who will defend uh, Mr. Maduro. So, I mean, you have two superpowers. Uh, we will not discuss American morals and Russian morals, but I mean, uh, I, I think the rule of law still exists in America to a much bigger extent than in Russia. And rule of law, which is a dream of Ukrainians, exists very strongly in Europe. Well, America is it's not... Uh, America didn't take away Crimea from Ukraine. America didn't uh, bring uh, millions and millions of ammunition into Donbass. So, I mean, we are not afraid of America, but we are afraid of Russia. Okay, thank you. Well, I think time slowly came to the end. It is two minutes past the end of our panel discussion. Please, uh, let us thank uh, Francesca Melandri, uh, Gabi Martinez, and Sandra Ireland for very interesting thoughts and ideas. And uh, yeah, you can thank me also. <laughs> and uh, please enjoy the festival. It is a wonderful time, wonderful place, and wonderful people who got here on both sides of the stage.